So my name is Jane Fleet. I'm the chair for Living Lakes Canada and welcome to our 2023 AGM. Thank you all for coming. Just a few housekeeping details. Uh, the meeting is being recorded and if you would like a link to the recording, you can uh, send a note in the um, Zoom chat and let us know. Um, we would like this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, you can either ask them at the end of a particular section or we are going to have a designated um, Q&A session at the end. Uh, so you could ask them as well. And you can use the, uh, the Zoom um, hand raising function at the bottom of the screen or type in the Zoom chat box and Nicole, our communications director is gonna be monitoring those for me because I'll get distracted. Um, and then with regards to voting, there are a few areas during the meeting when we do uh, have to vote. If you're a Living Lakes member, you do have voting privileges and you will have been sent some background material er earlier today. And for those of you that are participating that are uh, non-voting uh, participants, just bear with us during that time and they, they won't take long. And if you're totally inspired by the meeting, you can always uh, send us a, a little message at info at livinglakescanada.ca and we'd love to have you as a member. It's free and it's fun. and um, yeah, we hope we inspire you. I'd like to hand over to Claire Armstrong, our Applied Reconciliation Coordinator to do the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanna start off by acknowledging the indigenous peoples whose lands we are joining this virtual meeting from, and as well as the lands that Living Lakes Canada's water stewardship work has carried out on. Today, I'm joining from what is known as Vancouver, which is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. To me, that means I recognize that the land that supports me is land that has been cared for by these nations in a relationship handed down from generation to generation. And it's land that was not turned over to the Crown in any treaty or agreement. I also want to acknowledge that Living Lakes Canada's water stewardship work originated in the Columbia Basin in the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Tanaha, Tlaidli Tene, Shikwetm, Sinaix and Silks nations. And that now Living Lakes Canada's work spans across what is known as Canada. This acknowledgement means that we understand the role and responsibility that indigenous peoples across Canada have to this land and the water that flows through it and respect that relationship by uplifting their voices in water stewardship. This land acknowledgement reminds us that indigenous ways of life were disrupted by colonialism and that the land that provides us with wealth was taken from an indigenous nation. And now I'll hand it back to Jane, thank you. Thanks, Claire. So I just wanted to recognize that we, uh, the, the meeting does make quorum. We need five voting members. And I think we have a lot more than that this year, which is terrific. In the background materials that were sent around, there was an agenda. Um, and I just uh, would like to ask if there are any amendments or um, adjustments that people would like to make to the agenda before we approve it. You can either raise your hand or write in the chat box. Paul? Oh. <laughs> Can I ask for a motion to approve the agenda as written? I move. Laura, and a seconder? I second. Andy. Great. All those in favor? If you just raise your hand. Anyone opposed? The motion is carried. Also in the background um, material, there were the, the uh, 2022 AGM minutes. Um, and I would just ask if anybody had any questions or concerns about that those minutes. look like it. Can I ask for a motion to pass the minutes as written? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as written. 
Scott, thanks. And a seconder? I'll second that. Laura, all those in favor? And opposed? And the motion is carried. And we don't have any old business to uh, cover, so I get to go on to my report. So as another year uh, went by for Living Lakes Canada, I spent some time reflecting on our role as the board and how we've grown since we started in 2017. As board members, we're caretakers of the organization and we aim to steer Living Lakes towards a sustainable future by adopting sound ethical and legal governance and financial management policies. In order to serve as proper caretakers, this year we've become much more actively informed about the water science behind each program area. We've built into our schedule some monthly presentations from program managers and staff in order that we can become more knowledgeable and in turn, during our official board meetings, ask more informed questions. In following our duty of care for the finances of the organization, we supported the hiring of Brian Duffett, our finance manager. And now as a result of Brian joining the fold, we are becoming way more financially literate as an organization and as a board. With the help of our newest board member, Scott Meakin and Laura Bell, we have formed a human resource committee that has developed a modern and comprehensive human resources policy. And with the help of Brian Scott and Paul Bach, we also now have a finance committee. We under took evaluations of our senior management and we've confirmed that Living Lakes is being led by people who hold deeply the core values of the organization and who work tirelessly to advance the Living Lakes Canada mission. We felt that our CEO, Kat Hartwick's input in board meetings was instrumental and invaluable for informed decision-making. So we've made Kat a non-voting member of the board. Our goals for the following year will be to further recruit to and diversify the talents of the board, to become more directly involved in the strategic planning of the organization while leaving the day-to-day -day management to our very capable staff, and to continue to advance the public's knowledge of Living Lakes Canada and its mission to protect our fresh water resources for future generations. I would like to take this opportunity to express extreme gratitude for the volunteer work that our board members do. Laura, Paul, Jen, Scott, and Mandy. Thank you. Are there any questions for me? If not, I'll ask for a motion to approve the chair's report as presented. I'll make a motion to approve the chair's report. Okay, and a seconder? I'll second that. Scott, all those in favor and against, motion is carried. I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Bach, our treasurer, and Brian Duffett, our finance manager, to uh, give the financial reports. Well, uh, I'll just do a brief introduction and then hand things over uh, to Brian. Um, I think Jane really hit on the high points that I think what's happened this past year is that the programs have become built out uh, and expanded and the team has done a great job, Kat and the team, of not only um, making those programs happen, but getting behind the hard work of finding funders, um, because without the funders, we just can't do this work. And uh, the funders uh, have really been uh, generous and I think they've, they've understood the importance of the work. But what it's all meant is that our budget has increased significantly this past year, which is great. It's been able to keep up with the programs and hopefully we can keep doing that as we go forward. But we're, we're really realizing uh, just how big these programs will need to be. Um, and that's added a lot of complexity and uh, requirement for oversight on the board of uh, the, the, the valuable dollars our funders give us. And we have a responsibility to make sure that they're used appropriately and that the money is accounted for in all respects. And um, bringing on Brian Duffett, uh, a qualified uh, accountant has really made a big difference there. And he's been able to put together a budget in a meaningful way that we can follow. 
Uh, it's helped us with uh, forecasting and we have uh, real time understanding of where the dollars are going and what's needed and how each program is doing. So that's been a huge step up. And the finance committee, with uh, especially with Scott, who has a lot of uh, experience, has provided a level of board oversight uh, for how uh, a lot of the dollars are managed. And I think uh, I'm hoping our funders will be happy to hear about that. Certainly um, with Brian and with the finance uh, subcommittee and the board oversight, I think we really stayed lockstep with the, the really significant increase in the, in the budget that we have in the program. So that's all good news, really good news. Our audit went extremely well and the auditor was, uh, our financial audits, uh, despite the growth uh, was, we had a very good report. Um, I think that we, we've decided that Brian uh, is the most qualified person really to put together the budget for people uh, at the AGM to understand it and to walk through it. So he's, I'm gonna hand over to him now. And, uh, and as I said, he's been a great asset to the organization. We're really happy to have him on board. So Brian, I'll, I'll hand this over to you now. Thanks, Paul. I'm gonna share my screen here. Got some... Um... some slides here. Oops, that's not right. There we go. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, I'm, my name is Brian Duffett. I'm the finance manager for Living Lakes Canada, and I've been in this role since August of 2022. So right at the end of the numbers that I'm about to show you guys that we just finished um, our audit on. And um, I just wanted to start by saying that bad financial presentations are um, ones where there's a bunch of numbers on a piece of paper and you don't know what you're looking at and what it means. And good financial presentations tell a story and you can then use that story to make decisions and hopefully you'll make good decisions. And, uh, and it's funny because you guys, as the members, you get to judge whether or not we're making good decisions. So I'm here to present and you're here to judge. So uh, be, be, um, be kind. <laughs> um, so before I get into the report, I, um, I wanted to say the story of Living Lakes this year, when you look at our statement, is that we're growing, and Paul and Jane mentioned it, but yeah, Living Lakes Canada is growing. It's obvious when you look at any area of the organization, but it might be the most especially obvious when you look at um, the finance, the financials. Um, so I really wanted to use a lakes image to portray that, but I went with the gardening image because um, it's true. I believe that gardening advice translates well to financial advice. So I, I even say that if you have a financial problem, don't ask your banker, talk to your gardener. And um, my grandfather was a ferocious gardener, and he used to say to me, I think this applies to Levine Lakes, he used to say, do not pray for lighter burdens, but for stronger backs. And um, that sort of applies as we look at the numbers this year. So I'm gonna show you the, um, the audited financial statement in a minute, but I just wanted to show you um, the high level um, notes that I think are important. So our funding is up 90% year over year, 2.4 million this last year against 1.3 the year before. Our funding comes 75% from foundations, 20% from government, and 5% from other sources. Where do we spend our money? We spend it mostly on people. So our biggest um, line items are professional contractors, 45% of our budget. Um, our staff makes up another 30, 37%. So that's 82% of our budget right there. And um, the other thing I just wanted to note, I just added this visual here to kind of help 
show the growth story once more. So this is our funding budget over the last four years. The year that that we're talking about tonight is the third column here, 21-22. And it sort of shows what we're projecting to happen next year, which just ties into the growth story and sort of puts it in visual terms. So here's the added statement. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It was sent out as part of the background materials. Um, again, it just I just highlight that the funding just under 2.5 million this year. We've got our two large um, expense lines, which is the professional fees and our wages. I do want to note that we've got a, a healthy surplus this year in the bottom line there. And um, it's worth mentioning that that surplus is a result of um, support area cost savings. It's not a program surplus. Our programs are essentially breaking even and we're experiencing cost savings on the support area side because the organization is growing faster than we're able to keep up. Um, and, we're, and we're getting savings because of that. We've identified that me being hired is proof of that. Um, and uh, some other people on the team as well in communications and in development. So we're essentially using these cost savings that we've got this year to plug those gaps and ensure um, sustainability and fiscal integrity as we move into the future, as we continue to grow. Um, this is our statement of financial position right here. And uh, that's, this is essentially just a snapshot of our financial situation. Again, you can see the growth from 2021 to 2022. Our total assets in 2021 were 1.9 million and our total assets at the end of 2022 were 6.3 million. So significant growth. This is um, like Paul mentioned, we're getting funding to do the work that we wanna do, which is great. We've been successful in that. I want to highlight uh, here near the bottom, our unrestricted net assets of 815. You could call that like the emergency fund or the rainy day fund, whatever you call it. It's, it's a good measure of financial health to know that these funds are available. Um, should um, turbulent times arise, it's, it's just a measure of security for our team. The last slide I wanted to show you guys tonight was this program um, chart. So I know that a lot of people on the call may only be involved in Living Lakes in a, in a very specific capacity. And um, this, this slide sort of shows where our funding is going over the last year. Um, the monitoring framework is our largest program right now at 34%. The Lakes program is at 27%, and the presentation later tonight, um, if you didn't know, is part of our Lakes work. Um, rivers and tributaries at 15%, that includes biomonitoring and restoration work. Groundwater is at 12, administration at 10, and fundraising is around 2.5%. That this is all I had to say tonight. Do you have any financial questions? We are going to, those, those financial statements, the added statements will be available on our website once they're officially approved. So if you wanna dive further into them, they're there. You can also contact me. I'm Brian at livinglakescanada.ca. Thank you, Brian and Paul. If I can ask for a motion to accept the financial statements as presented. I'll move to, I'll move that. Okay. Laura, I'll, uh, and a, I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? 
Opposed? No, nope. motion is carried. Now I just like to hand over to Laura Bell, our vice chair. She's going to take care of carrying out the re-election of directors. I have a conflict of interest in this one. Hello everyone, I'm Laura Bell. And I'm going, we're going to go through the election of the directors. All of you that are voting members would have received a package in the in the by email that laid out the, the three members that um, whose terms continue on and don't need reelected, which is myself, Mandy McCroby, and Scott Meekin. But we have three directors whose terms expire today. And we'd like to put those three names up for re-election. I'll do them one at a time. The, their bios were sent out to all of you, so I don't think I'll need to read through those again. I do want to make one correction to Jane's bio, which says that she worked in Infermier for the last eight years, which needs to be updated now to 13 years. <laughs> so, um, so I think I'll do these one at a time. And what we'll need is for someone to move um, that they be reelected. And these are for two year terms. And then I'll need someone to second it and then we'll vote on it. So um, we'll do these first, we'll do Dr. Jane Fleet, who is the current, current chair of the board and her term then would go for two more years. So would someone like to move for Jane to be reelected to the board? I'll move, that, oh. I'll move that Jane is reelected to the board as chair. And would anyone second that? I'll second that. Okay, I didn't see who that was, but it's Paul Bach. Paul. Okay, so Paul Bach has seconded that. All those in favor? Is anyone opposed? Okay, welcome back, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Our second um, director up for another two-year term is Dr. Paul Bach, our treasurer, who you've just met. And do I have a motion to extend Paul's for two more years as a director and treasurer of the board? I'll make a motion. Okay, Jane moves it. And do I have someone to second that motion? Yes, I'll second, I'll second it. Okay, who was oh, sorry. that? I'm sorry. It was Jen here. Hi, Jen. Okay, so Jen has seconded. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. And is anyone opposed? Great, welcome back, Paul. We have one more director that's up for re-election and she would go for a one-year term and that is Jen T. Berge. And so I would like a motion to re-elect uh, Jen. I'll make a motion to re-elect Jen for a one-year term on the board. Okay, Paul, and then who, I can and Jane second is seconding it. All in favor? Is anyone opposed? Well, that's great. Thank you, everyone. That's, uh, we have a, a board now for another two years. Um, so I'm gonna turn you over now to Kat Hartwig, our executive director for the executive director's report. Um, great, can you hear me? Uh, okay, um, yeah, thanks very much. And I'm going to yeah, buckle up for the next 10 minutes and I'll whip you through our year um, before we have an amazing guest speaker. So uh, welcome to our annual general meeting and thank you for attending this evening. In reporting the achievements of Living Lakes Canada, we continue to acknowledge that this work is only possible because of our funders, our partners, our team board of directors, advisors, staff, and contractors. It has been a whirlwind year of unprecedented growth for Living Lakes. We've expanded existing programs and created new ones. And while this report will give brief in highlights of 2022, it will not fully demonstrate the nature of the relationships we were able to foster to make this work possible. So to begin with, applied rec reconciliation was and will continue to be the most important lens for our water stewardship work. The entire Living Lakes team completed the fundamentals of OCAP training, which are the First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession. Our Applied Reconciliation Coordinator produced a report that documented our work regarding reconciliation and engagement with Indigenous peoples, highlighting our strengths, as well as the challenges that we as an organization have to evolve out of. 
In the Columbia Basin, we built relationships to establish a data sharing agreement with Shuswap Band. We established some water monitoring priority sites in collaboration with Yakut Akluknik, learning to pronounce that, and supported purchase of equipment for collaboration with Yakanuki for their monitoring of the Goat River in the Creston Valley. We held elder engagement sessions with Shuswap Band and the Kiskanuk First Nation around water priorities and concerns for Windermere Creek and hosted a workshop with the Calm Guardians and training youth for groundwater monitoring. One of the greatest learnings that we have undergone this year was with Brian Holmes and the Upper Nicola Band working together to build a lake monitoring framework that finally embodies Indigenous guiding principles alongside a colonial framework. This has allowed for an applied shift in worldviews that will improve the possibilities of healing relationships with our lakes and our Mother Earth and with each other. Our biomonitoring programs help assess freshwater health and will be used to help measure restoration successes via pre and post biomonitoring. For STREAM, which is sequencing the rivers for environmental assessment and monitoring led by the University of Guelph and using DNA metabard coding technology, we hosted the first STREAM data workshop in partnership with the University and Environment and Climate Change Canada, and also hosting a STREAM course in Fredericton. For CABIN, freshwater benthic monitoring, a protocol developed by ECCC, we trained technical staff from Stolo Nation's research center working with Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance to independently perform assessments of the health of the Fraser River's tributary to restore salmon habitat. ITRAC DNA is a developing protocol that utilizes a non-invasive method of targeted eDNA and is co-led by the University of Victoria and Institute of National Research Science in Quebec. We collaborated with the ITRAC DNA team to build community training modules and supported Blueberry River First Nations with community engagement surveys to identify which species and locations of inter interest they wish to monitor. Three Living Lakes staff were trained in a targeted eDNA course to build up more internal monitoring capacity. We hired an eDNA program coordinator for our Eastern Slopes Aquatic Monitoring Collaborative which facilitated the collection of 52 monitoring samples from partners and co-hosted a biomonitoring workshop with the Bow River Basin Council. We were invited to give several biomonitoring presentations, including to the BC Assembly of First Nations Water Dialogue Series. For the Columbia Basin Water Monitoring Framework, supported by the Provincial Healthy Waters Initiative, we successfully implemented three pilot areas, the Mid-Columbia Kootenai, the Columbia Kootenai Headwaters, and the Elk River Valley. The purpose of this innovative framework is to use and build a water balance approach to collect the data needed to model hydrometric flows and to eventually support future community water budgeting information. This required establishing community reference groups for each pilot area and separate First Nations consultations. We hosted multi-sector community engagement workshops to understand community concerns and priorities for water monitoring needs in support of climate adaptation, and developed online surveys and map tools for this purpose. The resulting community feedback combined with the data gap analysis by Mac Hydro informed the site selection of the monitoring equipment. Between these three pilot areas and in one field season, we installed six climate stations, 24 hydrometric stations, six lake level stations and 11 groundwater observation wells. We now have a threefold increase in hydrometric stations compared to Water Service Canada's active stations in these same areas prior to pilot implementation. A full length report detailing the pilot implementation is available. The framework has garnered much interest, including from the regional district of Kootenai Boundary who experienced flooding and water shortages and from community members from South Country Baines Lake area experiencing decreasing lake and aquifer levels. Climate change is impacting mountain ecosystems, and in the Columbia Basin, we are past peak flow from glacial runoff. Our high elevation monitoring is a new program developed in consultation with academia, hydrologists, limnologists, and the province to guide monitoring protocols, methodologies, objectives, and preliminary monitoring locations while anticipating further, further guidance from First Nations. We tested the program in Kootenai Glacier Provincial Park, the Slocan Valley, and North Valhalla. New partnerships include the Alpine Club of Canada, Backcountry Lodge Owners, and Parks Canada. As part of our youth programming, the High Elevation team held a training workshop for the Girls on Ice Kootenai Expedition. 
The Kootenai Watershed Science Program successfully completed another year of long-term stream flow data collection, marking over 10 years of monitoring. These longer records can be used to estimate future stream flows. The snow surveys gathered provide information for flood forecasting, resident safety, and climate mitigation efforts. For our youth programming, we led hydrometric labs for Sel with Selkirk College students in stream flow and groundwater monitoring, and hopefully inspired the next generation of environmental scientists. The groundwater program expansion included seven new monitoring wells established in the communities of Cranbrook, Creston, Canyon, Lister, Nelway, Box Mountain, and Slocan Park, bringing the 2022 year-end totals to 29 active monitoring wells. We have 30 publicly available data sets on the hub and on the BC real-time data water tool. We created more partnerships with well drillers, pump installers, and were featured twice in Groundwater Canada magazine last year. That's uh, thanks to Carol. <laughs> the Columbia Basin Water Hub expanded the data repository to over 250 publicly available data sets. It gained 30 new, uh, new profiles, new user profiles, and has seen an increase in traffic averaging 400 users per month. The Water Hub team was selected to build a data portal for the Nicola Watershed Governance Partnership. This is a partnership between the Nicola Five First Nations governments and the province of BC working together under a formal agreement to improve the health of water and advance reconciliation. There's a full uh, length report showcasing the Water Hub and its development for your reference um, over the years. So for our lake programs, FIMP, which is foreshore integrated management planning is a protocol to assess lake foreshore health. And when lakes are resurveyed, the rate of change or loss of natural shoreline is assessed to help inform lake management policies. 2022 priority lakes included Arrow Lakes, Trout Lake and St. Mary's Lake and were surveyed using the updated FIMP protocol. Three FIMP reports and two foreshore development guideline reports were, recre were created. And this program was featured in the North American uh, NOMS Lakeline magazine. An indigenous knowledge and values framework was drafted to help prioritize cultural and archeological foreshore values in tandem with ecological values using the FIMP methodology, which you'll be hearing about later today and this evening with Brian and Georgia. In 2022, we laid groundwork for a new Action for Healthy Waters program intended to support the development of watershed monitoring programs and build capacity for community groups offering resources, tools, and specific training. The Yukon government approached Living Lakes and we agreed to facilitate exploratory research, enabling opportunities for a coordinated lake monitoring approach in the Yukon. Across the country, our National Lake Blitz program has grown exponentially while raising awareness on the importance of water monitoring to better understand climate impacts on lake ecosystems. In 2022, we had 160 volunteers who gathered data on 113 lakes from the Yukon to Nova Scotia. We had 80, 875 data points submitted to the Lake Blitz observation map and 248 photos submitted to the Lake Biodiversity Photo Challenge. In closing, this report was a brief summary of the year's activities, but foreshadows the extent of the work yet to come. People are rightly concerned about their respective watersheds and source water and wish to help build adaptation options for their communities and the ecosystems that support us. So we continue to build synergistic relationships based on mutual trust and respect to increase our collective resilience. Thank you to all of the dedicated, passionate people who make this work happen. And speaking of extraordinary partnerships, we are honored today to have Brian Holmes, Councillor of the Upper Nicola Band here this evening. It has been a privilege to work with him and we look forward to his presentation of interweaving traditional knowledge to water stewardship, which is up next. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Kat. Does anybody have any questions for, for Kat? It's a lot of information to take in. There's a lot been going on. <laughs> if there are no questions, I will ask that somebody make a motion to approve the executive director's report as presented. I'll move that to approve the executive director's report. It's Mandy. I'll second it. 
Great. All those in favor? Opposed? And motion is carried. I would like to hand over to Georgia Peck, our Living Lakes uh, Canada Lakes Program Manager, and Brian Holmes, Councillor from Upper Nicola Band, to present our guest presentation, Interweaving Traditional Knowledge to Waterships, the Water Stewardship. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. I've just shared my screen. Um, Can you stop sharing for a moment? It's Nicole. I just need to find Brian on the... Yeah, absolutely. Stop sharing. Thanks. Great. It was too quick. Yeah, too quick. There we go. Great. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thanks for that, Nicole. Okay, wonderful. Everybody can see the screen. Excellent. Um, well, just want to say good evening to everybody and thank you so much for joining us. It's an incredible turnout this evening at uh, the Living Lakes AGM and I'm very, very pleased to be here alongside Brian Holmes, counselor with the Upper Nicola Band and one of three co-authors of the Local Indigenous Knowledge and Values Framework. Uh, Brian and I, alongside Claire Armstrong, who we had the pleasure of meeting earlier in the meeting, um, also known as LLC's Applied Reconciliation Coordinator, uh, we, the three of us, co-authored this uh, framework with considerable contr contributions from UBC's Sustainability Scholars Program. We had three wonderful interns working with us from April to September 2022, and uh, they were huge contributors to the overall product that uh, we will be discussing today. So um, really what this framework was created to do was to instruct ways of harmonizing Indigenous knowledge and Western science. The goal being to create opportunities for both worldviews to work in tandem throughout the foreshore integrated management planning project process. Moving forward, we will refer to this as FIMP to save us some time. Um, and I will go and describe them a little bit later into the presentation as well for anybody who is new to, um, to the protocol or, or to the concept as a whole. Uh, but first and foremost, I do just want to introduce uh, myself and Brian. As Jane mentioned, I am the Lakes Program Manager with Living Lakes Canada, and I'm happy to pass it off to Brian just to introduce himself quickly to us all. Sure, good uh, evening, everybody. Brian Holmes. Uh, Councillor from Upper Nick, been on council for about 13 years. Uh, original background is working for a cattle company, which now I believe is the biggest cattle ranch in North America, Douglas Lake Ranch. Uh, spent 20 years working there. Now I'm full time working for the Upper Nicola Band um, and pick up a lot of extra work now that I'm full time for the band. Um, but it's great to be here. And Kat, great presentation. That's a ton of work. and amazing work um, that's being expanded on. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that, Brian. Wonderful to have you with us today. Um, so just so everybody is aware, this is a brief overview of our time together this evening. Um, given we're a little bit ahead of schedule, Brian and I get a little bit of extra time to chat, which is always a good thing. Uh, we will talk about relationship building the importance and significance of interweaving Indigenous knowledge with Western science. Uh, we will talk a little bit further about the local Indigenous knowledge and values framework that we co-developed over the past really two years. Um, it's taken to get us to where we are today. Uh, we will discuss applying this framework on a FIMP survey on Nicola Lake this summer. And then of course, there will be time at the end for questions and discussion. So without further ado, I will pass this on to Brian, who's going to get us started to discuss the significance of relationship building. Okay, thanks. Um, so I just really wanted to highlight the relationship piece. And then for me, it's, uh, it's a really critical piece um, to developing relationships and partnerships, uh, especially in the, the era we're in uh, today and how things have changed with government, with First Nations, um, and just the need for the work to be done. Uh, it's really, really 
important to ensure this is done properly um, because there's a lot of trust uh, built through this process. Uh, and just thinking back in, in terms of relationships built through uh, Living Lakes Canada, um, probably starting with Cat. Um, I can't remember what year it was, but I, I think it was through that uh, tour you were on uh, with the Nicola Watershed Governance pilot. I think it was at the time, and I was uh, I was a speaker on the tour about the lake, uh, Nicola Lake that we see here, and, and was sharing uh, some of the oral stories and traditions uh, about the lake and the importance of it, and. Uh, I think you chatted with me off, off on the side after about uh, some of the issues I had raised and and, and uh, mentioned that we should talk. And it wasn't actually till two years later, maybe after that, um, something came up and a discussion about that issue came up. And I remembered, hey, I talked to somebody from Living Lakes um, and was able to, to track you back down again and then really started to engage with, with everybody else through Living Lakes um with with yourself and reg and uh really trying to put something together to assist with some of the issues that upper nicola is facing within within our watershed uh and it was uh i think we'd put something together in relation to our four food chiefs which we'll get to a little bit later and i'll explain that piece but um you know those interactions those conversations we had at the beginning um, kind of really set the stage that there was uh, there's a willingness to work together. Um, but over those years, we really weren't able to, I guess, land on something that made it fit for us to work on uh, with the expertise that uh, Living Lakes had at the time and what our capabilities were. Um, and we've got a lot of issues in the NICLA around water quality um, invasives and all that stuff and uh, we've got a pilot project that's just working on watershed management um, so needing a lot of expertise uh, so then over the time uh, I think Georgia has the exact date I met her um, but it, it really uh, started picking up from there once we were able to find something uh, that we could work together on and Building off of that is um, where we get to with this framework um, that we're talking about now, which is quite unique. And I think when we started this, that's not really how I envisioned it, um, to be quite honest, um, for the FIP uh, kind of conversation is, is a bit out of my scope. Um, I'm not too familiar with it, how it's used or what it means. I just know um, Georgia came with a plan in mind about including indigenous knowledge and perspectives in it. So uh, out of the whim, I said, sure, let's uh, let's put some time and effort into this and see where it goes. And um, I think it started out with the, uh, I think we did a video clip and it started out with a kind of an interview um, and that was developed from there. And I, I think it really expressed where we wanted to go or needed to go with the direction where we're going. Um, and I think at this point, I don't think we've met in person. Um, and I don't know, Georgia, how many times we've actually met in person. It's probably only been uh, once so far. And, and I think we've known each other for a couple of years, right? So, um, is that right? Yeah, exactly. We met um, April 2021, and we've spent probably 20 hours in person together. Um, so quite an interesting partnership to build a, a working relationship in the age of COVID is, is a challenge enough as it is. Um, but I, Brian and I definitely did our best to get together as often as we could and, and be as communicative as possible. And um, as you mentioned, Brian, it, it definitely resulted in a strengthened relationship yeah so I don't know if you have further description of how we met further into this but 
Absolutely. Yes, I'd love to go through a little bit of the process on on how we develop this re this working relationship and um, really the commitment that we put into that has resulted in a wonderful product, which we will discuss further. But um, yep, as Brian mentioned, um, him and I were connected early about April 2021 by a colleague, Reagan, um, who connected us with Brian in regards to Living Lakes Canada's National Lake Blitz event. So it was um, actually a little bit of a different program that connected us. Brian had showed some interest in collecting basic water quality data to contribute to the Lake Blitz event on Douglas Lake. Um, and so we went back and forth a few times learning a little bit more about Brian's work removing invasive perch from Douglas Lake and some of the other issues that um, that area is dealing with. And um, luckily at that same time, after about at that time, three years of FIMP surveys in the Columbia Basin, the FIM team with Living Lakes Canada, uh, which is myself and our technical director, Bruce McDonald, we began planning to expand the updated FIM methodology into other regions of BC. Um, and we focused on lakes that had been surveyed using the, the previous FIM methodology. Um, so many lakes in the Okanagan and the Fraser had been surveyed between 2009 and 2012. And fortunately for us, Nicola Lake was one of those priority lakes um, that was identified early on in, in this project planning phase. So I reached out to Brian, as well as a couple of contacts with Okanagan Nation Alliance um, to assess interest in submitting a proposal to the Real Estate Foundation of BC to not only resurvey Nicola Lake, but ask for two years of funding in which the first year we could co-develop this local indigenous knowledge and values framework to better identify opportunities um, and, and really prioritize inclusivity throughout the FIMP project process, not only during data collection or field work or desktop review, but from start to finish and then beyond. Um, and so it took a few tries, but we were successful in receiving one year of funding from the Real Estate Foundation. Um, and that resulted in the framework that we are discussing here today. So we were definitely tenacious. Um, Brian has always been incredibly um, generous with his time and energy. Our monthly meetings typically are bi-weekly meetings and uh, we're texting most weekends to, to chat about work. So it's been a really wonderful process and uh, grateful for the opportunity to work with and, and learn from Brian. Yeah, I'll so pass just, it. Oh, just, just to pick up on this before we finish it. And it's, just, yeah. it's, and it's really important to hear and for us to share that with you guys uh, because it really builds uh, the future and how we work together and you know from a traditional um, perspective that relationship piece is key because you know the teachings are is, is how we treat each other uh, determines what happens on the land and how we treat the land I, you know if we're not in a good mind and in a good relationship it's the land it's the water that's going to suffer um, so we really need to work together and learn how to treat each other like family um, so when we do the work together it, it's in a good mind frame um, and even more so doing it on the land you know there's just there's this meeting on zoom but it's not the same as meeting in person uh, you really learn things about people when you meet them in person and it's part of it is a, a bit of a personal conversation and getting to know people personally um, because then it, it builds trust, it builds an understanding of equalization that we're, we're all just humans, right? It doesn't matter what color our skin is or what nationality is, but you know we all want to do this work um, for similar purposes uh, for the benefit of the land. So uh, as you see in these pictures, right, this is when we have the students out and that was, it was cold, it was windy, it was, I think it was raining. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun time in the middle of June. Um, and, you know, and to, to the relationship piece, even then get them to help me pull some perch traps, um, which is, a, which is another initiative, but it's, is it being an issue with lake health? Um, <clears throat> but just spending that time together, um, you know, conversing, chatting, you know, just having a good time. It's, it beats any day sitting here on a computer screen, but it also builds, 
um, that relationship. Because I remember when they were leaving, I've asked everybody, so I probably won't see you guys again, right, ever. <laughs> and it's I haven't seen Georgia in person since since this time, right? So it's um, unfortunate, but I think as we progress along, um, you know, more time is able to be spent because when we did spend that time uh, on on the ground, I was able to share um, some of the cultural stuff and able to explain it a lot better uh, for people, for them to understand. Um, and it's just way easier when you talk about it like that and, and show people, right, rather than trying to write it down and, and say, this is how you do it. Um, hence, I, why I struggled a little bit with with this framework process because it wasn't so much oral, it's something on paper. Um, but yeah, just totally um, glad and happy Georgia's been able to commit the time and and Kat for giving the space for, for that to be done. And it really comes to leadership allowing the team to, to do what they need to build those relationships for a better outcome with the partner. So, you know, hands up to to Georgia for sure for making the effort. Awesome. Thanks for that, Brian. Yes, these pictures, they were, it was, the weather was terrible, but we had an absolutely wonderful time um, learning from Brian and Yiming, one of the interns that was with us, had never been on a boat before and, uh, you know, conditions were great. So it was a, a vulnerable moment for him and definitely strengthened the relationship for all of us. Uh, as Brian said, just simply getting together, helping out with other initiatives, sharing food, just hanging out really did improve, improve the working relationship and our personal relationship so much. And um, I think the trust that's built in those in-person moments really helped shape the rest of the project for us. So uh, yeah, it was definitely any in-person opportunity is wonderful. Um, it actually, you know, created an entirely new phase within the FIMP project process, which is a place-based planning meeting. We'll chat a bit about this further on, but it was massively influential and can't say enough about it. Uh, I'll pass this one back to you, Brian, and we can chat about the importance of interweaving. Yeah, so this um, this conversation was a bit of a tough one and it's it's been tough, uh, I think across the province on figuring out this terminology and, and how to make it work together with the Western science. Um, in the NICLA through the watershed work, uh, there was a uh, characterization report that was done and, and the outcome of that report uh, quite clearly stated that any of the work and all of the work that's been done in the NICLA watershed was not inclusive of First Nations perspectives or anything First Nation. Um, and then in the NICLA over the years, uh, you know, back to the 80s and 70s, there's been a ton of research work done. Um, but it was lacking that. So part of that um, acknowledgement was we need to change that. Um, and how do we change that? Um, and that's that's the leading question, uh, especially when we're trying to work with uh, a colonial system um, and also work alongside of an indigenous knowledge piece. And it's, it's some of it comes up to education. What does this mean? Um, and, and what does this mean over here from a Western science perspective? Um, because they are two different worldviews. Uh, you know, Western science is more of a fact base and, and indigenous knowledge is, is that oral, you know, teachings that were from, from time immemorial from way back when. Um, so how do you put those together in a world where, um, you know, Western science at times is used for enforcement? Um, or is only accepted if it's proven. And so this is the challenge of how do we do this? How do we incorporate it? What does it mean when we do? Um, and I've worked on a few projects trying to do this, and it's it's a real challenge because what you want to do is put some, mix them together, and sometimes that doesn't work. Um, so we got to acknowledge them both kind of at the same process. Um, this one, I think we've... Uh, almost redesign something, but still kind of in the same framework, uh, but from an indigenous perspective. Um, and we have yet to, to field verify it, 
Um, but the approach is interesting, and I know there's probably a lot of people eager to see the outcome or what's been developed so far um, because it is a bit unique, and I know people I've talked to want to see it and, and implement it in other works that they're doing just because that's what everybody's asking for, right? How do we how do we get this Indigenous piece to it? Um, but we got to make sure we bring the knowledge keeper with it. Uh, at times, you know, information is asked for from knowledge keepers, but they're not included in it, um, which isn't appropriate. Um, so now we need to make the space to include those knowledge keepers in the process uh, somewhere, somehow. And through this framework, that's what we're doing. You know, that we're, we're incorporating it. We ensure that these things in place um, where it's inclusive. Um, and that's kind of where I was thinking when we first started this, you know, like we need to put something in here that includes us as First Nations people, includes our perspective. And how do we do that? Um, you know, the first round, it was really tough. I didn't see it. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't see how this worked for me. Um, living here uh, on Nicola Lake, I, I don't actually live at Nicola Lake, but that's part of our communities right there. Um, but drive it every day to go to town and seeing the houses being built on the other side, these three to $5 million houses um, without any say from us about how that impacts um, our culture. You know, when I look at the other side of the lake and I think I, I don't know if I mentioned it in the interview, but across that lake where those houses are built, we have history of a battle being fought over there uh, between two different nations. You know, there's pit houses over there uh, where a provincial park is put on, right in the middle of the grassland where everybody plays is a pit house. Um, and so that's that's what's happened over there without interaction like this. We've got a, a rock painting uh, right on the shore, and I believe it's within the almost 50 meters of, of whatever the, um, the regulations are. And there's a friggin' $2 million house, like 20 feet from it. Um, so when we see stuff like that, it really upsets us because there hasn't been efforts put in place to protect us. But this, uh, this one seems to be doing that. And it'll be interesting to see how we come out the end of it because uh, even when we just took the tour on the boat and explaining to Georgia and, and the students, about what these areas mean to us and why they need to be protected um, just really shows that we need more work um, done because it's not just about the water, it's not just about the foreshore, it's about everything that uses the water, that's around the water, access the water, um, and how things are changing. You know, we, we talk about um, having fish out of here, the, the burbot, in six foot lengths back in the 50s in that era. Now we're lucky to pull out a two foot length burbot uh, in a lake this size. So, you know, the lakes changed, uh, you know, the algae's changing, uh, the temperature's changing, there's a whole whack of stuff changes. So we need to put measures in place that are more extreme than what the regulations are now. Um, and, and hopefully we can do this with the indigenous uh, knowledge piece and then use Western science to better enhance uh, what we're doing. And I think uh, we can do this on a bigger scale. Government's starting to do it, but we need um, partnerships like this with Living Lakes Canada to expand this because it's, you know, we want the same thing. We're after the same thing. Um, you've got expertise. I don't. I've got the knowledge. You don't. So, you know, we can work together by changing these and changing policy. Um, to meet these stuff before it's too late, <clears throat> before it's gone. You know, I look at Nicola Lake in comparison to Okanagan Lake. It's, uh, and I ask, you know, where's where's the Indigenous consideration of any cultural aspects when you're putting in docks? There's no answer. Um, so I think what we have here could easily be taken over to the Okanagan and, and implemented um, which is more inclusive of Indigenous knowledge and um, just the ecosystem in general. 
Um, so I don't know. Georgia, if you have a take on what you've learned so far through this. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you you worded it so well there, Brian. For both Brian and I, it was very difficult to visualize the, the report that we were trying to write because there were very few similar examples for us to follow. Many of them were international um, and not based here in Canada. So it was a very non-linear process to developing the framework that we are quite pleased with today. Um, it, so much so that we created two completely different reports. Um, you know, the first one no less successful than, than what we have today because it really caused us to take a step back, restructure, rewrite the vision, rewrite the objective and kind of start from the beginning because we, we weren't, you know, what we what we had in mind was not what was produced our first time around. Um, and I think that was such a an amazing lesson to learn. You know, there's there's no straight process to this work. You have to be innovative. You have to be creative um, and patient and work together. And um, I think it's it's gone really well. And and, you know, as I've said, it was it was challenging for us to visualize what we were trying to work with and when Brian suggested we you know given this is such a place-based report and, and project let's bring it back to the four food chiefs to help us guide this process um, and really help structure the entire project so um, I'll move on to the next slide Brian and, and you could tell us a little bit more about um, the effectiveness of turning to the four food chiefs in not only this project, but various other initiatives you have going on. So the four food chiefs comes from a chapter, one of our oral stories in, and through some of our experts within the nation, like Dr. Gina Armstrong, uh, did some work on this to develop it into a kind of a governance structure that we can use. Um, and it really helps guide the process. Um, and it really highlights that we need to include all the perspectives in all the work that we do. So you've got uh, the bitter root, um, which is, is a relationship, inclusive connectivity, uh, the Saskatoon, which is innovative and, and just thinks outside the box, the black bear, which is the knowledge keeper tradition and, and the salmon, the people that just go and get it done. Um, and you need all those aspects within within this framework, uh, because without that, there's an unbalance. A lot of times we see a lot of salmon people, right, that just want to go and, and get things done and then not worry about the stuff after. But uh, you, we got to make sure that we're including the bitter root relationship people. Like I mentioned, for me, that's I'm a bitter root person. I really emphasize that connection. And, and you know, it's to me, it's the... <laughs> being a root-based plant is the root of, of all of this, right? And the, the sea of the Saskatoon is the creativeness and we don't see enough creativity. Um, and I think um, through this process and what I've seen Georgia present out of this was, was creative, different, right? Um, and then the black bear is one that's always missing as well as this tradition, the cultural orientated. Um, we don't see them in the process enough um, and it really helps they're supposed to help guide the process. Um, so we got to keep these things in mind. And, and this is why and how we based the framework on was this process of, of these understandings of these chiefs and how they relate and need to be uh, heard and included in the process. Um, so you'll see that as it goes through. Um, and it's a really, really valuable piece. Uh, this process is is used nationwide across the silk nation uh, so it's easily you know when i when i talk about the okanagan i think we can just take this and and say hey let's use this over here if if they accept it right so it's a really great story there's more to the story in the process but this is just the the short version wonderful thanks brian yes yeah, so the four food chiefs um were present throughout the planning and and delivery of this project. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, we do have a 
final framework um, that will be tested in the summer of 2023. So um, we've already gotten a few questions so far about whether or not we can share the link and, and share this report. Um, and the eventual answer is yes, absolutely. We're doing just a couple of other reviews on our end, um, and then we will be making it public. You know, Brian and I both feel the same in that we want the efforts that we've put in to support others and help shape similar projects. So um, yeah, we will definitely be sharing it um, when the time is right to do so. And hopefully that is sooner rather than later. Um, so I'll just quickly show this summary planning table because it's a really great almost executive summary of the local Indigenous knowledge and values framework. Um, so as you can see in the column on the left, those are the four food chiefs that Brian just discussed. Um, associated with each chief, we have a goal, an objective, and an outcome. Um, we've also broken down the FIMP pro project process. Um, so from you know, project planning all the way to project evaluate, evaluation, we've broken those phases into seven different project steps. Um, and again, this is a perspective from the authors. Uh, we have associated those phases with the individual chiefs that they align with most. Um, now, as Brian said, there is a level of each chief within each phase, within each of us, um, just some are more dominant than others. Uh, so this is just a really wonderful preview of, of what guided um, the framework from start to finish. And again, this wasn't created until a, just a couple of months before we finalized um, the official document because and, and we were changing goals and objectives up until you know really the last hour and, and I think that's such a wonderful reflection of the fluidity of the process and the project and you know there was no need to stick with what we thought at the beginning we, we were constantly reflecting and going back every you know every word every sentence in this document is there's so much intent behind it. And, um, you know, once we were able to break things down into the chiefs and get that structure, I'm obviously a salmon. Um, it was incredibly helpful for us to have those guidelines. And, um, you know, it was present up until report review. Uh, Claire, Brian, and I chose a review committee based on personality traits to ensure each chief was accounted for. Um, and, you know, some feedback would be very different from others. Certain people would notice mistakes that others wouldn't. And I think that was, yeah, just a wonderful addition that we thought of at the end to ensure inclusivity from start to finish. And so finally, and, you know, we, we've come up with the framework. Again, it took us almost two years to get to where we are today. Um, you know, I think Brian and I are equally proud and supportive and Claire, Claire joined us, you know, right again at the last hour and her input and contributions to the, to this framework turned it into something I don't think as Brian and I have said, we could have thought of, um, you know, having that third person uh, to add perspective was so influential um, to what we have today. So this is the Local Indigenous Knowledge and Values Framework. It was funded by the Real Estate Foundation of BC, uh, co-developed by Upper Nicola Band and the Living Lakes Canada. Uh, it is a living document. It is subject to change and evolution over time. Um, and as I said, we will be applying it to a Nicola FIMP resurvey this summer. Uh, this is an aspect that I think Brian and I were both most um, excited about was the fact that there was tangible application tied to this project and you know we made sure that that happened um, neither one of us wanted to create a set of guidelines or a guidebook that may or may not be followed but you know to ensure that there was application attached um, really ensured the the value of this project so we're extremely excited um, this does again prioritize inclusivity and it interweaves cultural and archaeological values with ecological values and brings it to the forefront of foreshore planning and overall watershed management. Um, you know, really the intent is aligned with the greater vision of the framework surrounding the values of relationships as well as, again, cultural and ecological integrity. Um, so we're very pleased with, with what we have. Um, I did just want to share as well the objective and the vision. 
again, these were changed time and time again, and, and, and we're very pleased with where we've come up or where we've landed. Um, but really the objective is to instruct ways of harmonizing indigenous knowledge and Western science, creating opportunities for both worldviews to work in tandem throughout the four short integrated management planning project process. I think that last line is so important because again, it's not just a box to check off, it's, it's continuous. Um, and, and we really ensured that this would lead and, and, and influence lasting relationships as opposed to just a project partnership and then a move on. Um, and ultimately the vision is an inclusive process for foreshore planning that places cultural and ecological integrity at the forefront of decision-making with a holistic approach supported by relationships. Um, so as Brian said, we're very much looking forward to applying this to Nicola Lake um, and seeing what kind of replication might follow and, and really supporting and striving for that replication. So uh, Brian, feel free if you wanted to add anything before we finished up. Uh, just on this one, this one is interesting because it, it wasn't sitting with me very well um, after it was all done and said and almost completed. So we ended up, I think I ended up forcing Georgia and Claire to do a little session online about reframing this and it actually ended out pretty well. Um, and for me, it, it really hits what we were trying to do. And Georgia mentioned um, the tangible action piece. And that's the another thing that really caught me and in, in, um, invested me to invest my time um, into this because it's 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 been quite a bit of effort. Um, but because I knew there was some actionable stuff that we can get done here pretty quick. Even though this isn't um, at a policy level like that, but it's still influential you know, on protecting and, and having our voice heard on, on an important piece. So, um, you know, I think it speaks volumes of to how things can be changed um, at a level like this um, and really make a difference. So um, it's, uh, I think for me, from what I've learned around FIMP, I, I believe it's taken it and simplified it into a process here is, is how I've seen it. So you now hands down to Georgia because I, I didn't, I couldn't get the first piece that was done. And I said, I, I can't understand it. She did some work and brought it back how it is. And it, uh, you know, it didn't meet, need much uh, adjusting after that. So great work there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was um, a challenge, but it was absolutely the most rewarding project I have ever worked on. And um, I just can't wait to continue on from here and and seeing um, you know, how well it goes as we start applying it. We've already you know, started applying the framework to the Nicola Lake FIMP project planning um, and things will be getting pretty busy in the next couple of weeks here. So um, we can finish it there if you're happy, Brian, and open up the floor to questions. I didn't really get into a definition of FIMP, so I'm happy to provide that if anybody would like it, but uh, let's just see where the questions go and we can go from there. Thank you all so much for your time. This was wonderful to share this with you. Um, any questions we can't answer today as well, feel free to jot down um, our contact information and Brian and I are happy to address questions directly or uh, provide some further details. I'm just looking at Lisa's question in the chat box. So yeah, Lisa, we can we can absolutely share this. It's just gonna take us a couple of days to get a few more reviews in and um, we will then be sharing a link and making it public. Georgia and Brian, if I've got, I get it's more of a, a, a comment um, than really a question. Um, that was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much is it really gave me so much more information and knowledge on what, uh, what we're doing in trying to integrate approaches. Um, Brian, you mentioned um, how this isn't at a policy level. Um, it's, 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 it's not something that can influence directly policy. However, my experience has been that when we take um, 
a grounded approach like this, something that's actually actionable in the field and show how well it works, that will directly influence those individuals um, in, in, in our various governments, what can work. And that will then influence policy making and decision making. Um, so I, I personally think the way this has been presented and as we pilot test it, I'm assuming that's what we're calling um, what we're gonna be doing this summer, um, show how the actions that we're taking with this framework can benefit both communities and the environment, that that itself will influence um, multiple governments, whether it's local, First Nations, um, federal governments, when they see the impact that this type of action can take and activity can take, it will have significant influence on policy decisions in the future. So I, I think this is really, really important work um, that uh, you guys are doing and have done and will continue to do into the future. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, I, I agree, Scott. And, <clears throat> and uh, I think I mean that when we first started in this, because I was kind of the question I was asking, you know, where does it, where does it fit and who's the decision maker? And, you know, where do we fit? Like, because it doesn't fit uh, for us as First Nations when we're not, we're not the decision maker on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I totally agree with where you went with that because uh, now I see that, right? It, it's, it's a tool um that can be utilized and if it's a great tool and built properly um it can change policy it can change how people do things um and i think that's where we we intended it to go because i think both me and georgia at the beginning said we we're going to develop this so it can be utilized elsewhere but there's, we struggle with that because we had to build it off a base first and and that base was an individualized community slash lake. Um, but I think the way the framework's gonna come out, it can be it can be used across um, for other communities in other nations because those four chiefs piece that I talked about, uh, the stories might be different in each community, but the principles are pretty similar. So, you know, if we could build it up principles rather than uh, specifics, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna be a great tool in it. And it's great to partner with with a organization like Living Lakes Canada um, that is starting to, to grow and, and build a name, and then everybody knows who who they are and who they're working with. So definitely a huge opportunity. Yep. Thanks again, Brian. Thanks, Scott. Um, so it looks like Elizabeth also asked if we plan to share this with other communities and if yes, how? Um, so Elizabeth, I think Brian just answered that question a little bit. Um, but Brian, I know you and I spoke earlier about, you know, the fact that the four food chiefs is specific um, and, and, and how we intend to, you know, one, we're, we will be creating a evaluation summary or an evaluation report after, after the framework is field tested. Um, Claire did a really wonderful job at recognizing the difference, you know, between measures of success being qualitative versus quantitative. Um, and we really want to ensure both of, of those different types of relational measures versus your typical year end reporting measures are both taken into account when we do evaluate the success of the project. Um, and I think we'll be creating a report um, based on based on that evaluation, which we can share with other communities. And um, I think at this point, that's that's what we have in mind. Brian, feel free to speak to that if you had other ideas. All good. Perfect. Um, and then it looks like Nicole, your hands up, but Jen did have um, a question in the chat pretty quickly. Um, she asked if we could comment more on the steps of FIMP and the food chiefs, and maybe an example. Um, that was on the slide. So uh, I'm happy. So the place-based planning meeting, for instance, that's one of the seven phases that we broke the FIMP project process down into. Um, it is phase number two, so it's early on. Um, specifically for the place-based planning meeting, it will be a collaborative meeting at Nicola Lake hosted by Brian. 
um, and it will include full participation by project consultants, uh, as well as the coordination team, which will be co-led between Living Lakes Canada and Upper Nicola Band. Um, the idea is that the place-based planning meeting will provide an opportunity for team members to experience Nicola Lake from an Indigenous perspective, and will encourage open community and trust building. Um, also, you know, provides an opportunity for field reconnaissance all at the same time. So really each of the seven project phases is broken down. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen so you can see the diagram of, of how we broke those steps down. Um, and then we also identified key actions that would be associated with each of um, each of those project phases key actions being down here. I think there's four for each project phase, uh, roughly. And um, again, you can see how we've broken down this project phase into different four food chiefs. We've identified, let me zoom in here. We've identified um, Black Bear as the more dominant uh, because this place-based planning meeting will be you know, steeped in traditional teachings. Uh, but of course, Chief Sia, Saskatoon, and Bitterroot closely follow uh, because this is a brand new phase uh, to FIMP projects. It is quite innovative. Um, and of course, inclusivity is playing a, a huge role here, which is why Saskatoon Berry is, is um, quite dominant as well. So that's just kind of an example of how the framework is laid out. Each of those steps have key actions as well as that breakdown um, and a description of, of how it will take place. Thanks. Okay, no. Thanks, Georgia. Is I just, that I just, that, yeah, totally. I just was looking for like, just because you're, there's so much information on that one slide on the screen. And then, but I figured there was more detail, right? More to it. And, um, and really interested to see, you know, how that happens in the, um, just from the whole process from the beginning, right through to the end, but then the opportunity to be out in the field together and looking at things together or whatever, right, whatever stage of the process. So yeah, thank you. I, it'll be really interesting to look at look at it, I think, when, it, when you're ready to, when you're both ready to release it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of requests, so we're excited to get it out there and uh, yeah. start, you know, getting some feedback and some thoughts. Yeah, I'll bet. Thank you. Okay, so Nicole, can you speak to whether there are lessons learned already before before field testing has taken place, um, and can they be transferable to work water stewardship with other Indigenous partners? Brian, do you want to take a, a shot at this one, and then I'll follow up because I definitely have lessons learned throughout this already. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what you say, but um, I think I think we've spoken to a bit of it already, right? And it's about that relationship piece right out the bat um you know that's that's the first initiation piece because that without that um you don't get what what we just shared with you today um and I've, I've done other projects where people ask the same well how do we get what what you guys got well uh it's really hard if we don't build a relationship like Georgia has um and if you don't provide space and time for that um it's just another annoying thing on the First Nations desk over here um, of somebody wanting to do something but you know if, if there's really consideration for time and and uh, a feeling of um, interest um, then it goes uh, 10 times further like like all this time that we spent on it um, meeting and, and messaging back and forth it uh, at the same time I'm doing 100 other things over here still but knowing that the effort that she's putting in um, is going to be worth it because it's um, it's got a different vision because of the relationship we built, um, and for me that's that's always the the lesson learned in how you can start doing that without seeing what we've done um, because a lot of the times um, what we show you might not be what the community wants, um, and they'll tell you by that engagement, and then you'll learn about what they want or how they want it done. Uh, instead of just guessing um, or thinking they they need this or need that when we don't, um, and and for us to expand into further work now with Living Lakes Canada, and you know we've we've got a proposal in the works here with Reagan to do more work on eDNA and the cabin and all that stuff, that is inclusive of all the other work we're doing with the ONA, 
around the issues that we need answered, right? And this is this is the problem sometimes when we have students, our universities coming in wanting to do work, but it's never related to our issues or our problems that we need resolved. Um, and you know, this is one of them because of the the housing and whatnot in Nicola. So, you know, the relationship and going on the land, because that really, I think for me, uh sold it, right? Because we I was able to share and and more emotionally explain why it was important and why we needed to change it. So I don't know what George's lessons were, but mine were very similar i you know we're we're planning this summer's um projects as well and we're wrapping up last summer's reports so definitely you know have started thinking way more in advance than i have in the past and ensuring i'm giving myself lots of time to reach out to partners far ahead of any um you know actual physical work taking place really to like brian said you know give as many individuals enough time to take part in the project um, and really just just be a lot more thoughtful about other other partners times and, and not just ours internally within Living Lakes. Um, you know, the on the land learning, we keep bringing it back to this because it is, I, I can't, you know, say enough how influential getting together in person is. Um, we'll be doing some FIMP surveys up in the Northern Fraser um, region as well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm already starting to plan a place based planning meeting for for that lake, um, for Fraser Lake as well, because, you know, we really want to learn from that. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity, COVID aside, to get together and, and, and be open and honest with one another, share our expectations, have that trust from the from the start, you really can't get that through a zoom or through a phone call. Um, so for me, any opportunity to get together in person is is one worth pursuing. And I think that's definitely been the biggest lesson learned. And just more input, the better, more, more perspectives, more ideas, more personalities at the table, more voices. It, it, it all, you know, it, it thus far has has really um, ensured a wonderful framework that um, we're all so proud of. And I think just, yeah, meeting every week as we have for the past couple of months and again just just spending time together we can i think our work can only be as good as as we are personally and that um yeah is something that we work for internally and externally in these partnerships as well okay so we're right at 7 30 pretty good timing um, are there any final questions? Brian, did you want to make any final comments? Anything um, that hasn't come through? I was going to pick on Claire, but if oh, she was, yes. it would be good because she came in in a little bit and it's always good to hear that, you know, when somebody comes into something, what they thought and I'm assuming Claire's still working with us. <laughs> <laughs> just... We're never letting Claire go. Claire's, Claire's around. Um, yeah, well, gosh, it was so interesting from my perspective coming into this. Um, I'd been a part of, of the project uh, at the summer for a brief snapshot. And then um, I went away and came back um, in the last stages. And the shift that had occurred um, in the time that I was away was was just like, in terms of deconstructing what had had happened along the process of developing this framework and kind of taking a pause to not push ahead with with maybe a report that might not have been the way we wanted to go but taking a step back and taking the time to restructure it from from the get-go again and just build that up with the confidence that um, like Brian and Georgia were on the same page because they had that level of communication and trust built throughout the whole process. That was really spectacular to kind of um, be privy to. But then also the other, one of the most um, influential pieces for me, which uh, Brian actually touched on already was um, a meeting we had like a couple of weeks ago. It was in one of the last weeks before we were trying to get the report out the door and Brian just, made us revisit 
the mission and vision. And, and we really had a moment where each of us kind of had the opportunity to share exactly what we felt the big picture was. And then, and, and we all had different perspectives that, that ended up accumulating into the vision that we created, which, which encompassed all of them and, and had all the important parts, you know, the relationship building, the ecological and cultural integrity and, and the inclusivity elements. So if it's anything, it's just a, another um, proof of, you know, having, having more perspectives and different, different kinds of people with different ways of thinking um, that really just adds value in many circumstances. So yeah, it's been great to, to join in again with you guys on this work and, and yeah. Yeah, Brian, I just, yeah, I wanted to thank you too for your patience in having to deal with our language because even the word framework makes me cringe. And so um, for me, like um, I'm much more aligned with um, looking at the four food chiefs and the, their lens on our work. And so I just feel that your patience with this process has been pretty amazing um, because it's it's also challenging for a lot of us who, um, yeah, who don't necessarily ascribe to the language that is used to look at lake health and the health of Mother Earth. So just to finish mine off, you know, Kat, hands down, um, it's been great. I've, I've worked with other members of your team in the Nicola Watershed Data Portal and totally uh, trust that, um, you know, the support is there from from your team and, and you know, uh, shout out to the board for building um, what is now, right? And I know, uh, Living Lakes Canada wasn't so much over in our area, but we're starting to hear more and expand and, and start to become a, a bigger player in some of the support we're doing. Um, we always say we could always do more with Indigenous inclusion partnerships and perspectives. So, you know, just to continue building on that and, and really picking that up because it's uh, it's great work and it's, it's very helpful um, for me and my community. So I just appreciate the time and and you know the space you provide and uh you know to georgia especially for taking the time and continuing the work so and you brian i appreciate you taking all of the evening texts and weekend emails and everything else that's gotten us to where we are today you guys this project just oozes uh, respect and creativity and excitement. And I agree with Scott. I think this is going places with regards to policy. I, I am so impressed. I really appreciate your work. Yes, perfect. Thanks, Jane. If there are no other questions, I think we are going to adjourn. Jane, Make a motion to adjourn. Jane, it's Nicole. I just want to add one thing to everyone yeah. who joined us this evening. Um, all the work that Kat was discussing in her report will be bundled into our 2022 impact report, which will be made uh, available for publication in uh, April. So I'm assuming everyone who's joined us this evening is on our mailing list, and that will be sent out to our mailing list in April. Thanks. Great. So we'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make that motion. And a seconder. I'll second. Thanks, Georgia. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks very much, everyone. everybody. Thank you.